everyone. Welcome to um, this afternoon's seminar series. Uh, today we're practicing three presentations for an upcoming conference. Two of them are finalists for Uber Clipper Awards, so please ask questions, hard ones. Um, and the way we're structuring this is about 15 minutes for the presenters and then five minutes for the audience, and then we rotate through. The first one, so I'm technically the host, I'll act as the chair of the, <laughs> of the session. So the first presentation today is by Mehmet Otskan uh, from Ohio State, Uni Ohio State University, UI. And his paper is titled Data Driven Personalized Energy Consumption Rates est Estimation for Plug in Hybrid Electric Vehicles in Urban Traffic. And we went for a long time. <laughs> All right. All right, Mehmet. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a recent work with my colleague at Carr um, on the data driven, data -driven and personalized energy consumption model for HUVs. Well, let me first talk about the data driven energy prediction models uh, in the literature. So, over the past years, uh, data driven models have been a game of interest, and one of the applications was predicting energy of the vehicles. And there are main functions that we have seen in the, uh, in the existing models. So they can provide energy estimates accounting for the different driving condition. And this can be depending on the traffic speed, road type, um, road grade terms, and also the assigned speediness in the traffic. We have seen there are some limitations in the data approaches. And the, the first one we have seen is there are limited work on the quantifying, quantifying the quantifying relationship between the driver behavior model and energy consumption. And the second limitation we have seen is uncertain quantification in those models have often neglected the fact. So speaking on the uncertain quantification, what we are talking about is uncertain quantification in these models. So predicting energy consumption is a very complex problem, and there are some uncertainties coming and uh, these uh, models that can be because of the, the data set and the data set structures. So we know the fact that energy consumption is influenced by different factors, including the uh, driver behaviors. If one driver is aggressive, other drivers relax. So we may see different uh, outcome from the um, energy consumption. And on the other hand side, if you are driving a vehicle in the city or urban or highway environments, you may see different uh, energy consumption prediction. And moving forward, if we have the PHV, so depending on what is the available field of charge in your battery, you may consume uh, different uh, fuel. Uh, that's depending on whether you need to charge the battery or, or you can deplete the, deplete the battery if you have uh, enough uh, battery range. So here we are trying to answer this question that can we design a energy consumption prediction model that can provide us the estimation and as well as um, also quantifies uncertainty in this prediction um, method. So we have analyzed existing data driven approaches, and what we can see, there are some limited works on quantifying the driver behavior with energy consumption model. What they do, they take the uh, driver behavior, rod features, and the vehicle conditions, and they can provide you what's the equivalent fuel consumption. If you're speaking of the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, we have to consider equivalent fuel consumption rather than fuel consumption. So they are predicting the trip equivalent fuel consumption. So what here we are proposing, we keep, we keep the same input. What we are doing is we are changing the output. We provide the point estimates for the energy consumption. And on the other hand side, we are also providing the upper bound and lower bound on the predicted equivalent fuel consumption. And our proposed approach is consists of uh, two steps. In the first step, we have conducted human subject study uh, using the uh, vehicle dynamics driving the simulator at car. So we have we have we got some participants uh, from the OSU and the car, and we collect the drivers' physical trajectories. So in this human subject study, we have asked the drivers to, uh, to just operate their vehicle in the simulator as they will do in the real life, and we provide some real uh, real time feedback such as the vehicle speed and speed limit of the round and we collect their driver specific trajectories once we have the driver specific trajectories we develop our data driven equivalent fuel consumption model we first 
um, identify the driver behavior model parameters for those uh, drivers that we collected uh, using their specific uh, trajectories. And we augment this driver behavior model with the physical energy consumption estimator. So in this study, we are considering the um, energy consumption model of the 2017 Chrysler Pacifica, which has been uh, calibrated using the experimental feed data uh, from the next car phase two uh, project. And once we augment the uh, driver behavior model with the Chrysler Pacifica energy consumption model, we are generating the data set to train our data-driven energy consumption prediction model. And this prediction model is namely conformalized quantized regression uh, methods. So it uses the two uh, benefits of the machine learning uh, frameworks, which, one, which ones are the quantile regression and other one is conformal prediction. So quantile regression does not only provide a point prediction, it also provides the uh, upper and lower level uh, uh, confidence intervals. And when we are moving to the conformal prediction, it enhances the quantile regression, it adapts the uh, conformal uh, intervals here. So to develop this data-driven approach, we have collected uh, driver-specific data from the human subject study. And to do this, we simulate the uh, urban route, uh, which is from the Columbus, and it, it has the eight kilometer rent. And we have 26 participants, and we have uh, instructed the drivers to, uh, to follow the speed limits and just drive as they would do in real life. And I believe maybe some of you were the drivers. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and they, you basically receive uh, real-time feedback based on your speed and also the uh, speed limit that you are accounting. And what we have done also, we kept the old traffic lights as green just to avoid any uncertainty coming from the traffic lights at that time in this study. Once we collect the data, the next step is we would like to identify uh, your driving characteristic using the driver behavior model. And what we did, we used the automatic driver model, which is enhanced driver model, which has been uh, developed by my colleague at OSU. We first identify your driver behaviors, and then we augment this driver behavior model with the uh, HV energy consumption model. Once we integrate this model, what we are looking for, we are looking for uh, what will be the, your energy fuel consumption um, if we kept your driver characteristics. The core concept here is that we would like to generate rich data set so that we can train our data-driven uh, energy consumption model. Um, if we only use the, the driver's data from the simulator, that is actually not quite enough data. So we try to, understand your driving dynamics and if we run Monte Carlo simulation to just to generate more rich data set. I'm going to uh, brief talk about this driver behavior model. So this driver behavior model is consists of three different modes, uh, free driving, freeway driving. So this is going to be uh, going to be on when there is no lead vehicle in front of you and when you are not approaching the stop signs or uh, red traffic lights. And there is a car following mode if there's any lead vehicle in front of you, that mode is activated. And once you have a stop mode, so if we have any uh, upcoming traffic lights which are red, or if we have a stop signs, that mode is again activated. So in this specific board, we were actually uh, focused on uh, five different parameters of this model that can represent the observed driving behaviors uh, of the human subjects. So those parameters we can uh, list as maximum acceleration, acceleration and acceleration component, braking coefficient and speed limit offset. Now we have the uh, model equations for this driver behavior model. Now what we have done, we calibrated those parameters using the collected uh, driver specific trajectories. First thing what we did, we segment the, our road into eight different uh, road segments. Why we did this? Because as a human driver, we cannot characterize your driver aggressiveness um, same as constant for entire road. We are talking about eight kilometer here. So what we did, we partitioned the partitioned the road in eight different uh, segments, and we tried to understand your behavior uh, when you're approaching the stop signs and when you're actually approaching the, the highway, 
and when you face with this image changes on the road. And we technically partition eight different uh, segments and we identify your uh, driver behavior parameters for each segment. And on the right bottom uh, figure, we have the uh, speed prediction error distribution. So what we can see on average, we have achieved almost two mile per hour uh, root mean square error uh, using this EDM prediction uh, driver behavior model, which basically verifies that we are actually capturing your behavior on average well. Now we have the distribution of these EDM parameters. As you can see from the figure, what we can analyze that there is a uncertainty in these parameters. So everyone has different own unit, you know, the patterns. So we can see that each parameter has its own distribution. But as I mentioned, with, with identifying these EDM parameters, uh, we have only limited parameters that we can work on. So we need to actually generate more data set that we can train this energy consumption model, right? So what we did next, we fit a multivariate distribution model uh, in these EDM parameters. And for this one, we specifically use uh, T. Coppola uh, multivariate distribution model. And on the right figure, we can see that uh, how the generated uh, parameters using this uh, T. Coppola distribution is overall matched with the uh, calibrated parameters. Now we are moving forward to uh, conformalized quantum regression based equivalent fuel consumption model. So let's consider that we have the data set we generated, and there is no unknown distribution in this data set, right? And we have the coverage level that we set it. So with this one minus alpha. So what does coverage rate mean? So I would like to generate prediction intervals. Let's assume that alpha is 0 0.1. Uh, in this case, it becomes 0 0.9. So I would like to generate prediction intervals so that uh, my observations from the driver, giving this one minus one, well, let's mention this uh, 0 0.9, which means 90 percentage. So 90 percentage of the time, my new observations will lie inside that prediction intervals that I'm going to construct using this method. But to first identify the prediction intervals in your prediction methods, you first need to have a baseline regression. Um, for this one, we are using the uh, light gradient twisting machine uh, quantum regression method. And this regression takes some inputs, which are the, uh, coming from the EDM parameters, as we talked before. And there are also three different uh, parameters that the cumulative consumption range estimator takes. Um, which are length of the route segment, speed limit of the route segment, and initial set of charge uh, of the plug and, plug and hybrid electric vehicle. So once we have these input variables, the so our output will become your trip fuel consumption, fuel fuel consumption, and the upper and lower level of the predicted trip equivalent fuel consumption. Now I'm going to talk about more mathematical details about this approach. So constructing prediction interval for this approach is involved in different steps that I'm going to mention now. Let's assume that we exclude the testing data from your data set, and we are splitting your data set into training and calibration. And we use this training data set to fit the, our baseline refresher um, for two conditional lower and upper uh, quantile functions, and we are defining our coverage rate here. And then what we are looking for after this point of view, we are calculating the, your conformity scores, or in other words, we are looking for your prediction residues. The prediction is reduced basically the distance uh, of your predicted values from the observation. So once we have the conformity scores, the next step is we would like to construct a prediction interval based on these residues. And we are calculating this um, by utilizing the empirical quantile of your uh, conformance scores. So here we have the key assumption in order for this approach to be valid. We are assuming that our whole data set is exchangeable. So what does exchangeable meaning that 
let's assume that I have a button and it has basically just 10 volts and it has three blue, three yellow, and uh, let's four uh, ground. So if even I, if I shake them technically, to picking one ball from that bucket, probably is not going to change. So what does it mean that if I shuffle my data, so probability of selecting one data points from the data set is not going to change. So that means data exchangeable. So in our case, our data set is exchangeable um, because we do not have any time series data. So time series data has temporal dependency. So time series data is not exchangeable. In our case, we don't have that kind of issue. So our data is uh, exchangeable and we can achieve these well prediction intervals. Now we are going to show more details on how we develop this data driven uh, prediction method. So to do this, we generated 1000 sets of EDM parameters from the Coppola distribution we have fitted. And we then uh, use these parameters to simulate driver specific trajectories uh, starting with initial of charge 26, 30, and 40 percentage. And then we have uh, split the, our data set into 80 percent for training, 10 percent for uh, calibration, and the remaining 10 percent for the testing. And we perform analysis of the, this proposed approach across the different CIDOFAR uh, prediction methods. And we set our miscoverage rate is 0.1. Now I'm going to show the performance analysis of the, our method. So on the right figure, what we can see, x-axis showing the, your true equivalent field consumption, and y-axis shows you predicted equivalent field consumption. Here we are showing the comparison of four methods, including our proposed CQR approach. Well, here we have the um, red dot point is representing the predicted value is that outside of the prediction intervals. And anything shows as blue means that uh, you cover those prediction intervals, you cover your, those points with the prediction intervals. And any point that shows the green is representing your true field, equivalent field consumption. So there are main differences between these approaches. The first thing we can discover is average prediction width. So, what does that mean, average prediction fit? For other methods, they are behaving conservative. They are providing very really large prediction intervals. But in our approach, we are providing narrow prediction intervals, meaning that we are not actually predicting as conservative as other methods. And also, we would like to show that we are outperforming not only in the average prediction width, but also we are actually getting closer to them in terms of the coverage rate. So we define the coverage rate 90 percentage. For all the methods, we have seen that 90 percentage has been achieved, except the one, uh, one of the baseline methods. So <coughs> I would like to actually show another figure that basically going to show the uh, performance of the, our proposed method. So now what I am showing here is we distributed data into five different actually uh, quantiles here. And looking at this uh, red histogram bar graph, we can see that our model is providing you very narrow prediction intervals, but other method provides you very fixed. So the main reason behind is that if you have high uncertainty in your data, this methodology can adapt those points. And if we have the less uncertainty in your data, this approach is, uh, tries to behave as less conservative and it is not providing you uh, large intervals. In this case, other methods are not performing in this case, they're just providing a fixed uh, prediction intervals. So I'm coming to the summary of this uh, talk. So what we have showed today is we provide data-driven equivalent field consumption uh, prediction method for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles uh, in urban route using the uh, quantile for formalized quantile approach. And this approach is predict equivalent field consumption considering the individual driving behaviors, route conditions, and vehicle characteristics. And to develop this model, what we have done, we calibrate the driver behavior model and we integrate it with the driver 
in the loop simulator trajectories and we basically formed our training data set. And what we have seen, this methodology can provide accurate field consumption intervals and it can outperform other prediction methods. So as a future work, we would like to extend this methodology for online driver behavior estimation. And we would like to explore personalized eco driving strategies uh, for the ADA systems. So before ending my talk, I would like to acknowledge that uh, we would like uh, we are very grateful uh, receiving support from Stellantis to improve the quality of this work. And also, I would like to thank my colleagues uh, as support this work, Dr. Starker, Dr. Kanawa, and I believe Luis, Luis is here. And thank you for all this great work. So, thank you. Any questions? Question from the audience. Questions? On teams, I don't see your presentation. I see. Yeah. So I can present from my computer. Should I instead? We can. You just have to log in with the teams. Keep the other meeting on so that they have the audio. Audio. Okay. Cool. Okay. What if you just share from your computer? Yeah. Just join teams so you can share. Yeah, that's what you should do as long as you join through the so it'll make the ice. Right. Um so you can share. Oh, so it looks like that's okay. Now I'm in the team. But then I don't think that will be able to. Yes, but I don't know if the audio is. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So, second presentation of today, paper is titled on Overture Construction Heuristic for Pickup and Delivery Routing Problems, and our presenter is Ethan Kazan from Ohio State. Thanks. That's your session chair is expediting the big efficiency. Anyway. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Um, let's start with the traveling salesperson problem. So this is the idea of you have multiple cities that you must visit as a traveling salesperson. And now your task is find what is the shortest possible route that you can take, which visits every city exactly once and then returns to the audience. This is a very well known uh, problem in cognitive optimization. And if you look at the problem formulation, we have this definition here where we use a binary variable of X, I, J to determine if the agent that is the traveling salesperson, goes from city I to city J. There's a cost to move from city I to city J given by C, I, J, and the objective is, of course, to minimize the total cost of the total flow. 
There are some constraints that define that an agent must start and end the tour at the depot, which is given by zero if you're starting from it, and it's given by two n plus one if you're ending there, assuming that there are two n cities. Now the agent must visit every city exactly once, and the solution must be only one tour that contains all of the cities, not multiple tours. So these are the constraints and problem formulation. Now this is an well-known NP-hard combinatorial optimization problem, which basically means that there is no polynomial time algorithm that can find a solution, the optimal solution to this problem. So this has been the basis of a lot of research in combinatorial optimization, but exact methods that can find you the solution to this is limited to a small number of cities, simply because it is so hard to solve. For this reason, heuristics are increasingly being preferred to find feasible solutions quickly. And what these heuristics do is they follow certain tour construction rules to find a solution. So these can be used to instantaneously find feasible solutions. They can also be used as an initialization for exact methods that you can converge faster. Now, one of these heuristics that is quite interesting is a convex hull cheapest insertion heuristic, and it makes use of a certain observation, which is if you have these cities, and now you want to find what is the optimal route, you can look at the convex hull, and it is quite likely that the optimal tour is somewhat near the convex hull. In this example, it is the convex hull. If it's another case, which is shown here, where there's a point in the interior of the convex hull, it's like the convex hull has been adapted to include that point as well. So the optimal route, we can say, adapts a convex hull of points to meet the interior planes. And this is the basis of the convex hull cheapest insertion heuristic, which we call CICI. It has been shown to produce superior solutions, which basically means lower cost solution than other heuristics like the nearest neighbor, which is a simple greedy algorithm, which I will discuss. Now, that is a classic problem. Something that's more relevant these days is the pickup and delivery routing problem, where you are a uh, delivery person going to certain pickup places where you pick up a package and then drop it off at certain other locations. So as I show here, it's in a city and then a truck that is responsible for these uh, items to be moved between different places. So we call these additional constraints precedence constraints, which means that a pickup location must be visited before a drop off location because of course you're picking up something. And so you see these problems in logistical application as I showed you, but also in other cases like tool path optimization, where you have to go and pick up a certain tool before you do the machining and so on, or in paint shops where you have to go in a certain path and so on. In this case, the problem formulation is slightly augmented. So the first part of the problem formulation is identical, which is the traffic problem. But now we have precedence constraints. The first one being that the agent, that is the traveling salesperson or the uh, delivery truck, starts with zero payload of each item M. As it goes from one city or one location to the next, the cargo capacity of that particular item increases when it's picked up and decreases when it's dropped off. At no point should the cargo of that vehicle become negative, which is basically meaning that it has gone to a delivery location before a pickup location. So these are the added constraints, but as you can see, this also has the same format where you're going to different locations in a certain order to minimize the cost. So this is also an NP hard combinatorial optimization problem, but it has not been studied as well as the TSP, the traveling salesperson problem. And so sophisticated heuristics that have been tailored for this do not yet exist. So what we look to do is, can we adapt the CNCI algorithm to handle precedence constraints as well? Let's look at an example of how we propose to solve this problem. So this here shows parents, which are basically pickups, children, which are basically dropouts, and a depot, which is basically a starting point. So there is more general uh, literature terms of how to say pickup and delivery points for things like paint shops and so on. Now you're supposed to visit all of these locations, but the parent must be visited before the corresponding child. So we start by again forming the convex hull, but instead of forming the convex hull of all the points, we look at just the parent nodes, which are these red dots, and the depot. So in this case, we see this black uh, polygon as the subtour initialization to the convex hull. And then you can choose a direction sense. So let's say we choose a counterclockwise sense. Then we look at every node that is not on this convex hull, which is let's say the subtour, 
So let's say that we have this point R. It happens to be a parent node. So a parent node can be inserted anywhere, right? Because it can be visited at any point of time. There's no real constraint of, uh, but that has to be picked up before something else. So in this case, we look at the insertion cost ratio for this node with respect to every segment that exists on the board. So this cost ratio is given by CIR plus CRJ, which is basically CIR plus CRJ is what is the added cost if you try to insert it, divided by CIJ, which is a subtracted cost if you were to add that to the board. If it was a child node, there's an added constraint, which is that you can only insert it in regions of the tour where the parent has already been picked up. So in this case, this being the child node, the parent node here, since we're going in this order, only this highlighted region can have this node inserted to it. Now again, we look at all the different uh, edges that exist in this tour, and we look for what is the cheapest possible edge for insertion. Once it's done for all the nodes that are not on the tour, we then insert whichever node has the lowest insertion cost ratio. So in this case, let's say that this node here has the lowest insertion cost ratio, and with that, you update the tour to include that particular node. We then repeat the steps three to four, which is basically you keep checking the insertion cost ratios for the different parents, children, the people nodes, and then you insert whichever one has the cheapest uh, cost ratio to the set segment. You find what would be a complete tour where every node has been visited. Once this is done, you have a certain cost, but then you start again from the initial uh, convex hull because we made an assumption there, which is that we're going counterclockwise. To account for the other possibility, we also repeat it in the clockwise direction, which I show here with this arrow. And you find the complete solution and you pick whichever one has the lowest cost. So this is the algorithm description. Let's look at it with an actual benchmark instance. This here is from the TSP LIB. It's a standard benchmark for the channeling salesman problem. And we've added some parents, children, and people constraints as marked here. The segments mean that that is the precedence constraint for that particular item being picked up or dropped off. So we start with the convex hull subtour, which is what I mark here with this purple uh, polygon. And we start by giving, let's say, a clockwise direction of travel. So with that, uh, we can then, yeah. So then with that, the algorithm goes through all the remaining points the highlighted segments here are what is the insertable segment. And uh, we can see that it addresses every single point that exists. If it's a child node, only certain segments of the subtour are feasible. Well, if it's a parent node, uh, any of it, any segment can be a feasible uh, insertion. So with that, we go through all the points that exist and we find the final solution, which let's say costs 543 distance units. Then you change the direction of the travel. You start again. So in the beginning, you're going to be inserting all of the <coughs> parent uh, the points at the periphery because these are all happening to be parents. And then at some point, we reach a case where there is a child node. In this case, when the child node has arrived here, uh, it now has only a certain feasible segment for insertion, and it gets inserted there. After which, the algorithm continues and finds all of the remaining points. Let's say this is now the counterclockwise tour. Because it has a lower total cost, we then provide this as a CHCI algorithm uh, output. So this is the CHCI algorithm adapted for the precedence constraints. Let's look at a benchmark algorithm as well, which is a 3D algorithm called the nearest, nearest neighbor algorithm, which is the only one that we found in literature. So in this, the idea is that you basically start from your depot, and then you go to the nearest feasible point and you keep doing that. You keep going to the nearest feasible point until all the points have been visited. So if you look at this, it's much faster because the amount of calculations to be done is very minimal. You're just sorting the different points which are feasible and uh, which is closest to the current. So with that, we find again a tour here. And this here is what we're calling the benchmark algorithm. Let's now also consider two different kinds of spatial layout. So there is a central children, which is what we've been looking at so far. So the parents are all situated in the periphery. And then there's a central parents case where the children are the periphery. So now the bigger points are centrally located and the dropper points are on the periphery. 
We also look at multiple different instances of the PSP LIB benchmark data set. So this here is a different instance called the EIL 76. The previous one was EIL 51. And then once we, once we analyze the performance for 60 different instances, what we see is that for the central Sudan case, our algorithm outperforms the nearest neighbor algorithm in every single instance that has been studied. However, when we go to the central parents case, uh, that performance is not found. And if you try to understand why that happens, um, if you look at the central parents case and we try to see what actually happens when we are running the algorithm, we start with a much smaller convex hull. And so as the different points are being added to the subtour, in the beginning, the insertion costs are smaller, but towards the end, when you have a lot of points that are feasible far away from the insertable segment, which you will see here, what happens is that the addition and the cost is much higher for a small step. You will see this uh, as the algorithm progresses. We have the children and the pairing nodes being added. Yeah, so now you can see that the size of the segments is much larger. And because of that, the total cost that is being added towards the last few insertions is much higher. So if you look at the uh, cost ratios, where we see that, uh, so basically the x-axis here is the cost ratio of this R algorithm to that of the nearest neighbor algorithm. Whatever is on the left is good, which is why I said that for central children, uh, I got that really well. For the central parents, it did not perform as well, which I just explained to you the reason why. Uh, so that means that our algorithm is well suited for operations that we see in flexible manufacturing systems where you have a certain set of equipment in the middle of your factory, and then you have inventory shelves on the outside. So if you have robots that are picking these, it's very beneficial to use this. Or warehousing facilities which have similar settings, or maybe digital commerce settings where you have uh, these sorting locations far in the suburbs of the city and the actual customers in the within. So now the delivery truck goes to these different uh, pickup positions and then goes to the customer. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the heuristics follow two construction rules and they're used to one, instantaneously find feasible solutions. So I showed you how we find really good solutions in this method. And they're also used as initializations for exact methods. So a popular exact method solver is Groby. It uses many, it uses a suite of different algorithms. And what we can do is we can send this entire problem formulation to Groby and it will provide you what is the optimal solution. As I mentioned, it takes a lot of time to find the solution. So what our algorithm, the heuristic can do is if we provide that as the initial solution to Groby as a warm start, we should be able to get the optimal solution faster. So let's look at the performance now for the central children case, which we know is going to be performing better. You see that if you look at just the heuristic solutions, our algorithm, the adapted CHCI algorithm, has a better solution in every single instance that we study. If you look at the performance when you provide it as a warm start to the exact algorithm, what is shown here as standalone is our benchmark, which is the algorithm being run without a warm start. If you look at using the nearest neighbor solution as a warm start, in some instances we see that the performance is not as good as even just initializing the exact algorithm without a warm start, which means that it is not actually going to convert it in some instances. For ACHCI, our algorithm, in every single instance for the given computational time limit, we were able to reduce the <coughs> uh, reduce the solution cost within a certain time frame. In case of central parents, we see a similar behavior. So in this, even though the ACSCI algorithm is having a higher heuristic cost, when it's provided as a warm start to the exact algorithm, we are consistently finding an improvement in the solution cost, while the nearest neighbor does not always do that. So as an observation, regardless of the spatial orientation, the ACSCI solution always accelerates the exact algorithm convergence while the competing nearest neighbor does not. And in conclusion, the algorithm improves the convergence of exact al algorithms. The ACHA algorithm is highly suited to spatial configurations that we see in logistic applications. Then we have delivery locations in the periphery. If you're using it as an 
if you use the ACSF solution as an initialization for the MLAT algorithm, it still helps. Also, because the near neighbor algorithm is very simple, it can be implemented very quickly. And in the cases where it performs better than the ACAC algorithm, we can always choose that as the solution that you want immediately. So as you can see here, the nearest neighbor algorithm provides a solution almost immediately, while our algorithm takes some more time because of the sophisticated nature of addressing the point insertions. With that, I thank you for your time. Uh, this QR code directs you to the paper where you can see more detailed uh, analysis of the results. The part of this presentation will be presented at the MECC conference at the end of the Thank you. So did you consider a mixed case where the parents and children were like mixed together, or did you only do inside yeah. outside? We did actually. Uh, for concise, we did not include that in the paper, but as you can imagine, when it is random, there's a planning case. Our algorithm did perform better, but it was not something that uh, we could replicate every time. So it's like, how do you define random? So if I had a Gaussian based distribution, then it might end up again happening that the parents are centrally located. It was difficult to replicate. So uh, for that reason, we did not include it. Good questions. Unless you want to. No, I was contemplating, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be safe. Thank you. Well, you'll be at MECC. <laughs> so you have a month yes. to contemplate something. <laughs> anyway, next presenting. I asked him to agree here, but just nobody responded, so I'm going to go with yes. But I think that's going to make sense. Maybe. No, I, I, ran, I was testing it. All right. Ryan is on there. Late. Yeah. Or early. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last presentation of today. We have. Is it sharing the drive screen? Yes, it is. All right. Last presentation of today. So these three presentations will be in different sessions of the conference. Um, so the last presentation is titled Using Flexibility Set Back in the Demand Side Control of Distributed Networks. And our presenter is, presenter is Audrey Blizzard from the Ohio State University. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. Practicing my, my, chair, my chairing. So um, minimize the pain. Thank you. So, uh, as Dr. Stocker mentioned, my work will be focusing on using flexibility setback in the demand side control of district heating networks. So, as everyone knows, climate change is a uh, growing problem, and we need a lot of innovation, innovative solutions to address this. One of the areas that is uh, ripe for innovation is in the heating and cooling of um, Residential and commercial buildings. So in residential buildings, heating and cooling accounts for 57% of the total energy usage. So obviously reducing this in any way would be a major step forward in reducing overall energy consumption. Uh, one of the methods that have been used to uh, reduce energy consumption is district heating networks. So district heating networks centralize the process of heating a building. So rather than having an individual heating system, in each of your buildings, you centralize the process of heating water and distribute this heated water through a network of underground pipes. This is a lot more efficient um, just in general because you're using economies of scales to heat up the water. It also allows you to integrate um, renewable energy sources and waste heat in your heating a lot more efficiently than if there's a very decentralized system in having heating systems in it. A lot of the work focused on the control of district heating network has been on the supply side. And focusing on the supply side means that we're focusing how heat is getting sent into the system. In this work, we're going to be focusing on the demand side, which is focusing, is looking at how heat can be distributed to the individual buildings throughout the network. Um, existing methods really focus mostly on uh, proportional control and gain scheduling for the network. So not a lot of work has been done on how to specifically use control methods 
to control all of the individual buildings. And this is mostly due to the scale of the system. There could be hundreds of buildings connected to the network, and that can be very computationally infeasible to act early. So district heating networks have three main components. The first is the heating plant. So this is how water is going to be supplied to the network, as I said. And in our case, because we're not focused on the supply side, we're going to model this as a constant temperature and mass flow rate where the mass flow rate is there. The second element is the pipe network. So these are what distribute the heated water to the buildings. Um, these are buried underground and insulated to prevent heat losses. And there's two sets of pipe network, two sets of pipes, the distribution network and the return network where the distribution sends out the heated water and the return network returns the heated water. And finally, we have the users. So these are the consumers of heat. And right now we model these as flexible consumers so that they don't have a constant demand and rather are flexible in how much they demand. And they're extracting water from the network via heat exchangers, which then return water at a set temperature back to their current network of pipes. So considering the model for these three components, we first have the mass flow rates, um, which is how fast the water is flowing through the pipes. And in this case, we're using a pressure, a nonlinear pressure loss equation where the pressure loss is proportional to a friction coefficient and the mass flow rate through the pipes. Additionally, we look at the pressure balance, which ensures that um, the total pressure loss in every branch of our network is equal. And this is very similar to the cost voltage law. And we also have our conservation of flow, which ensures that the mass flow into a node is equal to the mass flow out of a node, which is very similar to care cost current. On the temperature side of things, we have a conservation of energy equation, which is how we model the individual pipes in our networks, where we're assuming that the heat loss to the environment is the losses and the heat into the network is provided by the pipe upstream, which is our T in. The interconnection of the individual elements in the network can then be used to create a dynamic model of the system. So here we have the temperature dynamics and all of the non-user edges is a nonlinear function of the mass flow rate and current temperature, where the mass flow rate is our control variable and uh, a function of our external inputs, such as the supply temperature and the ambient. So now we look at how we model the buildings. So in this model, as I mentioned, we're going to be modeling the buildings as uh, flexible so that they don't have a constant heat demand uh, relative to time. So here we use what's called a flexibility envelope to quantify how much flexibility a building has. Uh, we're able to assume that we have the supply heat based on the temperature of the water in the pipes and this constant return temperature, which we assume is met by the heat exchanger. And then you're able to calculate your building temperature. And from this, you're able to set up a upper and lower limit where you ensure your building does not deviate in temperature more than a given desired amount. Um, where these temperature upper and lower temperature limits are actually a function of time, which is where we would get into the time varying flexibility. We're going to use this flexibility to resolve our control objective, where our goal is to minimize the losses in our system and ensure that the user flexibility, which is the second term in our cost function, is still um, maintained during operation. So as I mentioned, we're going to be using a time varying flexibility profile. So here, um, a lot of buildings often use a concept of setback temperature. So overnight, they will turn down the desired temperature of the building when the building is unoccupied. We're going to extend this concept to a setback flexibility where we ensure that the um, residents, the flexibility envelopes are smaller during periods of occupancy and larger during unoccupied times. Uh, we have different flexibility envelopes for different types of buildings. So we have four different types of buildings we've identified in our system, residential, commercial, retail, and medical. We're assuming that the medical building is occupied all the time. So we have a constant flexibility envelope of two degrees Celsius um, entirely. And then in the other ones, it depends only on occupancy. So we have different uh, increased flexibilities during periods of unoccupancy. So this is obviously, as I mentioned before, a very large scale control problem. So rather than solving it in a single centralized um, optimization problem, we're going to use a hierarchical control scheme to be able to resolve this. Control. So our hierarchical control scheme relies on two levels. The first is the low level controller, which assumes that the subsystem is required to maintain a certain pressure loss and then solves for the optimal solution assuming that it's maintaining this pressure loss. This is then repeated for every subsystem over a variety of pressure losses, allowing us to scan the entire search space of total pressure losses. 
So this is the low level optimization problem. We have that cost function, as I mentioned before, where we're minimizing the losses in our pipes and minimizing the deviation from our nominal heat demand. We also have the flow equations, which I mentioned um, here and um, mentioned previously in the modeling section. The only difference is that we now have the pressure constraint in 1D, which ensures that the total pressure loss is equal to that set value. Then we have our temperature evolution equations where we calculate the heat divide, er, provided to the buildings. And finally, we have the flexibility envelope constraint where we have that time varying flexibility. This problem is then, as I said, resolved over a series of total pressure losses and over all of our subsystems. So we'll have a total of six subsystems. Then after all of the low level problems are resolved, we move to a the high level controller, which uh, determines which sets of pressure losses are compatible and then determines the lowest cost set by summing up the individual low level costs to give you your total high level cost, ensuring that the pressure losses are consistent. So this is the optimization for the high level problem, and this is an integer programming problem. So we're using um, a selection integer. So this is just solved um, manually. And then we have our pressure balance equation where we have a slack variable to because of the discretization of the individual subsystems. We use a slack variable to uh, allow some deviation from our provided solution. And then we have to find the mass flow rate that we require from the plant, and we do this by calculating the totals of all the individual subsystems desired mass flow rates. Finally, we have the rollout where we send the desired total mass flow rate to the plant, and we set the valve positions based on the selection selected solutions from the low-level set. For this, we uh, ran a case study using 20 buildings that were uh, realistically selected in the Chicago area, as they have a district heating network already supplying their heat. Uh, the heat capacities were used for these 20 buildings were taken from NRL's Comstock and Redstock. Additionally, we took the ambient temperature profile for February, the week of February 2nd, and from the Chicago Midway area. And we used realistic network parameters for length, friction coefficient, and uh, insulations, and we assumed a constant supply temperature of 80 degrees. This is the case study, so you can see how all of the buildings are connected. You can see that we have a variety of residential, medical, commercial, and uh, retail buildings in our case study. So here are the results of our simulation. You can see overall we were able to reduce the total energy losses by 2.4% uh, uh, using our flexible case. Additionally, you can see that this a lot of this gain came from reducing the initial mass flow rate and the wasted mass flow rate. So you can quantify wasted mass flow rate by mass flow rate that goes through our bypass edges, which do not supply heat to the user and instead directly recirculate it. And you can see that we actually reduced that wasted mass flow by 22% and our initial uh, total mass flow rate by 9%. And then this is just a sample of the used flexibility. So on the top row, you see the nominal demands of the four types of buildings that we were considering. And on the bottom, you can see how much uh, each building used in their flexibility profile relative to um, the upper and lower limits. So you can see as the upper and lower limits are expanded, the buildings are able to use more of their flexibility um, without impacting uh, comfort of the residents. And finally, this is the low co level cost for rated by pressure drop. So this is essentially what the high level optimization problem will see in a single time step. So you can see all of the different potential pressure losses um, over all of the different days. And so one column of this would be selected or would be used to select your high level solution and then iterated over all of the days. So in conclusion, we were able to show a 2.4% reduction in total losses as compared to our nominal case. Additionally, uh, we're going to look to convert this problem from the hierarchical scheme that you saw to a distributed optimization problem to reduce this iteration, as you can see, that's required over a bunch of different pressure losses and instead have a single uh, solution. And we're going to try to figure out how we can partition the system to improve this performance even further. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Questions? In that figure at the top, can you tell me what are the, it seems like it's a discrete set of values. So as we go 
from the top to the bottom, what do they mean? So these are the total pressure drops over each individual subsystem. So we assume it maintains between 0 0.05 and 1 pascal of pressure drop in the subsystem. So we solve um, a total of however many on the vertical axis you see, and then solve for each time step. So this is the horizontal is fine. And then it adds up. So basically this uh, feasible pressure is over all of these, and that's your total cost. It's the sum of all of your problems. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming and thank you for bringing us to the presentation. So, if you have any comments and questions in the com coming days, please ask them. They will be presenting on the conference. All right. Thank you for presenting today. Thank you. Thank you.